If life has taught us anything, it's that very few things are guaranteed. That being said, if you had the pleasure of walking into a toy aisle during the 1980s, one guarantee is you'd be able to find a G.I. Joe figure or vehicle sitting on the shelves waiting to be purchased and taken to its new home. By this point, the 3 and 3 quarter inch O-ring based G.I. Joe A Real American Hero toy line by Hasbro had long been a fixture during a child's playtime. The possibilities fueling our adolescent imaginations as well as the world building capabilities lent itself well to lengthy, all encompassing adventures if you were just looking to have a good time. The 1980s saw a period in which G.I. Joe was reintroduced and shifted away from its predominantly realistic military feel of the 1960s and its adventure team rebranding of the 1970s. The 80s downscaled rebranding and its associated media tie-ins would bring G.I. Joe to a whole new level of popularity within the young male demographic audience. And while some of its roots were still grounded within a military background to some degree, the fantastical elements and more colorful presentation allowed for G.I. Joe to feel more like a varied and eclectic special missions force during its war against crime and terrorism. From this perspective, the 1988 roster of action figures and vehicles did a lot to add to what G.I. Joe had to offer. Following up on the monumental years of the early and mid-1980s was no small task, and we can have a closer look at the 1988 lineup of G.I. Joe right here and now. Let's begin. It's no secret that when you set the bar high, that whatever you do next has to live up to what you did before. And while each individual fan or collector can decide for themselves if 1988 lived up to the lofty existing expectations that G.I. Joe had already set before, it's always worth revisiting what the pop culture media vibe looked like this particular year to set the climate for this particular discussion. Of course, some of our favorite rock bands were still churning out hits from existing music albums, and the box office gave us some great classics both in the way of live action as well as in the world of animation. And the small screen gave us plenty of entertainment such that we not only look forward to premiere airings, but reruns as well. Elsewhere in entertainment, Nintendo would continue to secure its foothold in North American markets, while rival company Sega would up the stakes with its 16-bit Mega Drive console in overseas markets, a machine that would be later imported into the Western Hemisphere as the now historic Sega Genesis. And of course, in the sports entertainment genre, Hulkamania would take a temporary backseat as Macho Madness filled the airwaves. Circling back to the toys of our youth, by 1988, the big three boys toys of the 1980s were beginning to give up some ground with others losing steam faster than others. The initial run of Masters of the Universe was done by 1987. Now, the Transformers concluded its animated run in North America during 1987 as well and elected to shift its toy line a little by introducing new concepts in 1988, albeit to mixed results by comparison to its previous blockbuster levels of success. And with a new major player on the market this year, which was now occupying the attention span of the same target audience, it's worth examining the G.I. Joe toys of 1988 to see how they stacked up against the concurrent market competition as well as its own existing and established lofty standards of years past. Now, G.I. Joe did find some new ways to stand out. In particular, this 1988 year was heavy on sub-teams, giving us the likes of Tiger Force as well as Night Force and Destro's faction known as the Iron Grenadiers. Some characters were revisited in new versions at the time, and G.I. Joe filled out its usual expected assortment of new characters, both in single carded form, but also as drivers and pilots for vehicles. Of course, an often welcome name back into the lineup is that of Sergeant Slaughter. Now in his third O-Ring version, this is the first where you could remove his hat, making it a little different than the others. This one also doesn't come with his baton or swagger stick, unlike the previous versions. Loyal fans of the Sarge will tell you that there will never be enough versions of him. 
He's the master of the Cobra Clutch, applying the hold not only on his fellow wrestlers, but also to fans at conventions and even at the bar after hours. Another thing he's the master of is vehicles. And that's because in addition to his Triple T from 1986, his 1988 version meant that he was also packed in as a vehicle driver again, this time now with the Warthog. The Warthog was known as the team's amphibious infantry fighting vehicle and its two heavy missiles attached to its top meant that it was a force to be reckoned with on the field of battle. Joining the Sarge as a return character to this lineup is Storm Shadow. But wait, this time Storm Shadow fights on the side of good as opposed to evil, now a sworn brother in arms to fellow Arashikage ninjas, namely Snake Eyes and Jinx, it's interesting to see such an iconic character from the Cobra ranks defect to the side of the Joes. Storm Shadow is joined by another sword-wielding Joe this year in Budo. That said, he's a samurai rather than a ninja and serves as both the role of infantry as well as hand-to-hand -hand combat instructor. And because some Joes feel right at home in the Arctic, this year's Snow Joe is Blizzard. Joining the likes of Iceberg, Frostbite, and Snowjob, this cold temperature soldier has a lot of accessories and it's noteworthy that he comes with both a set of snowshoes as well as skis. We then make our way from cold environments to much warmer ones because Charbroil here is the team's flamethrower. He joins 1984's Blowtorch as a heat weapon specialist for G.I. Joe. And because we saw a football player in the prior year with the fridge, we now have a center field baseball player in hardball. He comes decked out with his green backpack and his signature multi-shot grenade launcher. Whether it's in the baseball diamond or on the field of battle, hardball means business. We then get a heavily camouflaged character with hit and run. Serving both the role of an infantryman as well as that of a mountaineer, this G.I. Joe, along with his ultra-cool loadout, is a favorite amongst collectors. Joining him in the ranks is an explosives and demolitions expert codenamed Lightfoot. And on top of that, we had this swamp fighting expert in Muskrat. Muskrat is right at home when covered up to his knees in mud. Over here, Repeater is another one of the team's heavy machine gunners, much in the same way as Roadblock. He's a combat vet with a ton of experience and is known for his top-notch performance when under fire, simply because he's the one who leads the charge when it's time to shoot back. And another Joe known for his bravery is Shockwave. A former member of his regional police department SWAT team, he's known for being the first one to kick the door down and head into a dangerous situation. The team also had a point man this year with Spearhead. The animal theme was back to because Spearhead came packed in with his bobcat companion known as Max. And adding to the vehicle driver ranks alongside Sergeant Slaughter this year was Skidmark. Skidmark is a soldier who isn't afraid to shy away from his need for speed and was packed in with a six-wheel drive, fast attack vehicle called the Desert Fox. And clearly there was something of an affinity for bright colors this year because Windmill sported similar orange and greens to that of Skidmark. Being an aircraft operator who never shies away from a hot landing zone, Windmill came packed in with the Skystorm X-Wing Chopper. No, not the Star Wars X-Wing, this is the G.I. Joe X-Wing. We then get to some larger vehicles, and in particular, the Phantom X-19, which is a sleek looking stealth fighter with a ton of features. With a slideable cockpit and a ton of armaments, this fighter has the right technology to get behind enemy lines for an undetected attack. This amazing vehicle was piloted by the scarf-wearing Ghost Rider. No, not the Marvel hero, but someone who works hard to not get noticed and make sure he blends in, thus making him the perfect pilot for such an aircraft. The Mean Dog was another of the large vehicles this year. With a noticeably massive cannon and a bunch of missiles, the Mean Dog could separate into a front recon vehicle, as well as a rear vehicle, and a detachable standalone cannon. Its driver was the machete-carrying armored vehicle operator named Wildcard. But the largest vehicle this year would be the Rolling Thunder. The Joes were never known for a shortage of firepower, and this heavily loaded vehicle could extend to over three feet long. It could display it in both a folded up mode as well as a more attack ready mode. The two garishly massive missiles can be extended and are probably what make the Rolling Thunder stand out more than other vehicles. It's got no shortage of features as well, what with several gunner seats, 
its extensive cannon in the back, as well as a scout vehicle and a detachable turntable of missiles. Unfortunately though, the driver who came with the Rolling Thunder is a bit underwhelming, and that would be Armadillo, who of course reuses the same name as the small 1985 tank. There's not a whole lot to say about this figure, but for collector purposes, you may as well have him since he was the one packed in with G.I. Joe's most heavily armed vehicle. The Mail Away concept made its return this year as well. Once again, with a few proof of purchase certificates sent in the mail, you could then be the proud owner of this brightly dressed and armored figure that goes by the name of Super Trooper. The base figure consists of reused parts from past characters, and what stands out about him most is his oversized silver shield. Great for display, albeit not so much for practical purposes in the field. Super Trooper also had the pleasure of having his own live-action commercial. And the mail-aways were not limited to just the figures this year. The Vamp Mark II from 1984 got a mail-away re-release, now in a lighter color shade. Other vehicles you could find in stores this year included the Swamp Masher, as well as small ones like the RPV or Remote Piloted Vehicle. The sub-teams gave us some varied looks for our favorite Joes too, operating in deep, remote jungle missions to take down a network of Cobra bases, are the aptly named and aptly dressed Tiger Force. Something must have worked out quite well because some of the Tiger Force's vehicles were indeed captured and re-outfitted Cobra vehicles. For the carded figures, Duke made his return, as did our favorite warrant officer in Flint. Bazooka is here as well, and so is Dusty. Lifeline was back as the team medic, and Roadblock was here as well, fulfilling his usual heavy gunner duties and Tripwire was also back performing his mind detector duties. Frostbite moved over from the Arctic to the jungle and now saw his Snowcat re-outfitted to fit the sub-team as the Tiger Cat. And up in the skies, the Dragonfly came back but was now called the Tigerfly. Interestingly though, this time it came packed in with Rikondo rather than Wild Bill as its pilot. Though Rikondo is right at home in the jungle environments anyway. We then get a new character known as Sky Striker, who has the same name as that of the 1983 jet, albeit this time he was flying the redecoed up Cobra Rattler, which was now called the Tiger Rat. Other Tiger Force vehicles included the Tiger Shark, which was formerly the Cobra Water Moccasin, done up now in Tiger Force colors, and the Tiger Paw was the Joe's new ATV, done up as a newly recolored Cobra Ferret from 1985. We then make the move from the deep jungle terrain to the cover of night for covert operations under darkness. This would be the first year that the Night Force subteam would be introduced, and this initial offering saw the return of another six Joes. Namely, we once again had Lieutenant Falcon, as well as Outback, Crazy Legs, Tunnel Rat, Psych Out, and Sneak Peek. These were a Toys R Us exclusive and were sold as carded two packs. This subteam had their own vehicles as well, which consisted of the Night Raider that was a recolored version of Sergeant Slaughter's aforementioned Triple T. The Nightshade was a redeco of Deep Six's Shark vehicle. The Night Striker was a hovercraft that was this team's version of the Killer Whale. The Night Storm would be Night Force's version of the Persuader. And curiously, the Night Blaster was a recolor of the 1987 Cobra Maggot, so I guess it looks like Tiger Force wasn't the only team that was making use of captured Cobra vehicles this year. Taking a page out of the Night Force playbook, Battle Force 2000 was back as well and now re-released as carded two packs rather than being single carded like they were the prior year. And as lengthy of a discussion as we've already had on the Joes, they still needed someone to fight against this year. Thus, the enemy forces had their own shakeup in 1988 because Destro decided to form his own faction known as the Iron Grenadiers. Destro himself now sported a gold helmet rather than a silver one and had a very regal look, what with his cloth cape and a fancy sword. He came packed in with his own small flying vehicle, which is known as the Despoiler. Do take note that for this subgrouping, we see the words Iron Grenadiers the enemy rather than Cobra the enemy on the packaging. Other Iron Grenadiers vehicles included the Demon or Dual Elevating Motor Ordnance Neutralizer, which was the largest of this team's vehicles, albeit it still paled in comparison to the Rolling Thunder. 
the demon did have a slot along the top for Destro's despoiler to land on. There was also the AGP or anti-gravity pod that had its rotating jet pods, and these vehicles came respectively packed in with the ferret driver for the demon and the ultra-strong nullifier pilot that was needed in order to man a difficult vehicle like the AGP. The Iron Grenadiers also added Destro's general, a mercenary by the name of Voltar, with his bird companion. And then there was the Iron Grenadiers troopers themselves, which is a rank of elite army builders handpicked from Destro's various bodyguards. It's always great to have several of these flanking Destro himself. Now we can talk about some of the standard Cobra the Enemy offerings this year. So to that point, we have a few army builders that were non-Iron Grenadier affiliated. For example, here's the Hydro Viper, which was a surgically altered Cobra eel that could withstand the side effects of deep water diving. Way up in the sky, we also had the Astro Vipers who were, get this, a Cobra Knot as opposed to a Cosmonaut, I guess, and these Cobra Knots man the orbital stations and perform satellite repair work for our enemy faction. And the Toxo Viper here could go into hostile and hazardous environments for their leaders. An undesirable role for Cobra soldiers, but a necessary one for sure. The Dreadnoughts bolstered their ranks with this rebellious brute. Road Pig was a rule breaker of the highest degree by nature. Though that being said, his loadout looked really great, what with the cinder block hammer, a crossbow, as well as his shoulder pads and spiked blocker shield. We also had the Star Viper that was a specialized strato viper whose reflexes were needed to execute extremely fast maneuvers in the air and that's because they came packed in with this space vehicle known as the Cobra Stellar Stiletto. The Cobra ranks rounded out in 1988 with the Secto Viper, who was a specialist in marine surveillance and amphibious operations. They came packed in as the driver of the Cobra Bug, which is a mid to semi-large bright colored vehicle that just looks unique in every way. Though it did have a ton of openings as well to house a fair sized crew of your enemy forces. The remainder of Cobra's vehicles this year included the missile firing Cobra Adder, the Cobra Battle Barge, a small missile tank known as the Imp, and a mail-away re-release of the 1986 Firebat, which originally came with the Terror Drone. That said, this one is a brighter shade of red than the first release. And just like in 1987, a whole ton of small motorized action packs were released, with options for both the G.I. Joe side as well as the Cobra side. And Battle Gear Accessory Pack number 6 came with a bunch of recolored Cobra weapons and backpacks from earlier years. That covers the toy line as far as 1988 is concerned. Now, overseas, Action Force would continue to embrace the imports of previous G.I. Joe figures, further adding to its lineup which were branded as international heroes as overseas equivalents to the already existing real American heroes in North America. The comics by Larry Hama had some interesting storylines unfold. This was the year of the Cobra Civil War, which took place between Serpentor's forces and the forces of former Crimson Guardsman Fred Seven, who was still posing as Cobra Commander. That, and we would see the formation of the Iron Grenadiers under Destro in parallel with what was going on in the toy line. There was no cartoon series in 1988, as this was the year wedged in between the 87 animated movie by Sunbow and the 1989 relaunched by the production company Deke. Overall though, even though the 80s were winding down, Hasbro still relied on G.I. Joe, which was very much a household name when it came to toy and media entertainment within the adolescent male demographic. If anything, G.I. Joe was the establishment, rather than being an upstart toy line on the rise. And that in of itself could prove to be a challenge to sustain as the decade closed out. But that didn't take away from everything that G.I. Joe, a real American hero, still managed to accomplish here in 1988. And for that reason, this year, like all its previous years, is still very much considered as a success. And if you enjoyed this video, don't go anywhere just yet. I'm going to put another G.I. Joe history video that you can click on right over here. Or for a look at an altogether different toy history topic, you can click on this video right over here. And with that, yo Joe, and I'll see you all next time. Thanks again, and take care.